Chris. Chris, did you kill your wife? Chris? In the quiet town of Columbia, Illinois, a family of four seemed to have everything a beautiful home, a stable job, and a place in the community. Chris Coleman, a head of security for a well-known ministry, lived here with his wife, Sherry, and their two young sons, Gavin and Garrett. But under this perfect surface, cracks were starting to form. Chris and Sherry met in 1997, and their early years were promising. Chris had a disciplined background, having served in the Marines before joining Joyce Meyer Ministries as a bodyguard. Sherry was known for her warmth and kindness, bringing a positive light wherever she went. Their boys, Gavin and Garrett, were lively kids, loved by their family and friends. Although Chris's work took him away often, the family was seen as close-knit. Sherry was a dedicated mother, and her friends described her as a loving parent. Yet, friends began to notice that things were not as perfect as they appeared. Tensions were growing, with Sherry often alone due to Chris's long travels and busy schedule. Columbia is a small town where people know each other, adding to its charm and sense of security. Homes line quiet streets and families move through their routines in a peaceful rhythm. To the locals, Chris and Sherry's home was just one of many in this serene community, until the unthinkable shattered that peace. While most people saw only the family's happiness, hints of hidden struggles lay beneath. Chris had begun receiving mysterious threats messages that suggested harm could come to his family. These warnings felt ominous, and yet, no one could have guessed what lay ahead. On a quiet morning in May 2009, something unimaginable unfolded in the Coleman family's home. Chris Coleman claimed he left early for his daily workout, but when he returned, everything had changed. In those few hours, a horrific crime had taken place. Upon entering the Coleman residence, investigators were met with a haunting scene. The home, once filled with signs of family life, was now marked by darkness and tragedy. In the bedroom, Sherry lay motionless, her expression frozen in fear. The boys Gavin and Garrett were found in their beds, the innocence of childhood stolen in a single night. A grim silence filled each room, broken only by the eerie sight of spray-painted words on the walls phrases that hinted at punishment and revenge. The chilling messages covered several walls, with harsh words aimed at Sherry. It was clear that these phrases weren't just random markings, but held a specific and disturbing meaning. The house seemed almost frozen in time, every corner bearing witness to the violence that had unfolded. The initial discovery was made by a police officer who had received a call from Chris. When Chris hadn't been able to reach his family, he asked a neighbor to check on them. That neighbor, also a local officer, cautiously entered the house, but even his professional experience hadn't prepared him for what lay inside. His reaction shock. The first thing I remember was the smell of spray paint. It's like staring the evilest thing, you know, Satan right in the face. And disbelief was visible as he took in the scene. When Chris arrived, his behavior was noted to be unusual. Instead of displaying shock or horror, he seemed distant, as though trying to process the enormity of what had happened. Neighbors and first responders were equally stunned. In a community as tight knit as Columbia, the idea of such a crime was unfathomable. Investigators began examining the crime scene in detail. One of the first clues was the spray-painted messages, which were written in a red color that seemed deliberately chosen. This paint choice was carefully documented, as it hinted at premeditation. Further investigation revealed no signs of forced entry, casting doubt on the idea of an outside intruder. They found emails threatening harm previously sent to Chris and allegedly from a stalker. However, as detectives delved deeper, they noted inconsistencies. For instance, some of the spray-painted words were similar to phrases in those messages, creating an eerie connection between the threats and the scene inside the house. Each piece of evidence led to more questions, and the full truth remained out of reach, hidden somewhere within the silent walls of the Coleman home. With a crime so unimaginable, law enforcement immediately took action. Leading the case was Detective Jeff Connor, known for his keen instincts and dedication to detail. Connor had built a reputation on piecing together even the smallest clues, and he understood the stakes involved in unraveling what had happened to the Coleman family. Detectives began by thoroughly analyzing the scene and gathering witness statements. The lack of forced entry hinted at someone familiar with the family. As investigators combed through the home, they also studied the threatening emails and spray-painted words, drawing connections between the two. The red spray paint found on the walls was soon matched with a receipt from a nearby store linked directly to Chris's credit card purchases. Interviewing friends and neighbors, detectives learned about Chris's recent behavior and unusual absences. One of the strongest testimonies came from a neighbor who recounted Chris's calm demeanor despite the horrific news. His reaction stood out, sparking suspicion and leading detectives to look deeper into his story. 
Investigators also noted that Chris had received several threatening emails in recent months' messages that would soon come under close scrutiny. In the early days of the investigation, several people connected to the Coleman's were questioned, including close friends, neighbors, and co-workers. As investigators delved further, they uncovered a surprising twist. Chris was reportedly involved in a relationship with Tara Lintz, a friend of Sherry's. Tara's name added a complex layer to the case though she initially claimed to have no knowledge of the crime. Detectives were also mindful not to jump to conclusions, knowing that family dynamics could be complicated. Each person of interest was questioned thoroughly, and details about their statements were cross-referenced to uncover any inconsistencies. As the investigation continued, detectives found misleading elements within the case. The threatening emails, originally thought to be from a stalker, now seemed oddly crafted with phrases that resembled the messages spray-painted at the crime scene. However, nothing was concrete. Forensic analysis revealed that the emails might have been sent from Chris's own laptop, yet investigators couldn't immediately prove it beyond a doubt. Uncertainties loomed over the case as the detectives pieced together the sequence of events, carefully treading between clues and maintaining an open mind. The community held its breath, anxiously waiting for answers as the case gradually closed in around one person. While investigators worked to connect the dots, more details emerged about those closest to Sherry Coleman. The most unsettling revelation came from Chris's own life, a secret relationship that had been growing in the shadows. Chris Coleman, once seen as a dedicated family man, had led a double life. The investigation uncovered that he had been involved in a serious relationship with Tara Lentz, a longtime friend of Sherry's. Tara had been close to Sherry for years, making this hidden affair even more painful for those who knew them. Friends and family described Tara and Sherry's bond as sister-like, adding another layer of betrayal to the unfolding story. Chris's motivations became clearer as more about his affair surfaced. Despite being married, Chris had promised Tara that he would soon be free to start a new life with her. This promise created tension, and some close to the couple later said they noticed subtle changes in Chris's behavior leading up to the crime. When questioned, Chris initially denied any infidelity but soon confessed his relationship with Tara. His interviews with detectives were marked by noticeable tension, particularly when asked about his future with Sherry. The strain was evident. No! You, you have to tell me the truth, Chris. I am telling you the truth! You, you, were you involved in her death? No! His tone fluctuated and his answers felt rehearsed, raising suspicions even further. Tara, too, was interviewed, and while she denied knowledge of the crime, her discomfort during questioning left investigators questioning her role. Friends and neighbors recalled seeing hints of stress in Chris and Sherry's marriage, though no one had expected things to unravel so tragically. Every piece of information painted a picture of a complex web of deceit, desire, and desperation a motive that would soon become the foundation for the case against Chris. As investigators built their case, several pieces of critical evidence came together, bringing them closer to the truth about what happened to the Coleman family. The final breakthrough came when forensic analysis traced the threatening emails back to Chris's personal computer. Investigators also found that the spray paint used to write threatening messages on the walls matched paint that Chris had, recent had recently purchased. These pieces, alongside witness statements and behavioral evidence, painted a clear picture pointing directly to Chris. The investigation left no room for doubt, leading to his arrest. In the courtroom, the atmosphere was charged. Family members of Sherry and her sons sat in quiet heartbreak as each piece of evidence was revealed. The prosecution laid out the facts clearly and without speculation, focusing on the betrayal and deception that had led to this devastating crime. Chris, who maintained his innocence, showed little emotion, yet the weight of the evidence was unmistakable. Chris's motive, as uncovered by investigators, was rooted in his desire to be with Tara Lintz without jeopardizing his career or reputation. Divorce wasn't an option due to his position within the ministry, so he took a darker path, driven by desperation and deceit. In the end, the court found Chris guilty, closing the case but leaving a community forever changed. The aftermath of the Coleman family tragedy left a deep scar on the community of Columbia. Friends and neighbors, once comforted by the town's quiet, now felt shaken, struggling to comprehend such betrayal within their midst. For Sherry's family, the loss was overwhelming a life interrupted by shocking betrayal that could never be undone. For the detectives who worked tirelessly on the case, emotions were mixed. They felt relief in delivering justice, yet sadness for a family torn apart by someone they trusted. Detective Jeff Connor later reflected that cases like these were rare but unforgettable, reminding him of the importance of both vigilance and empathy. In their, bed, in their home, 
uh, in the city of Columbia or anywhere else uh, in, in, in any city. The Coleman case reminds us of the unseen struggles that can lie behind closed doors, leaving us with a lasting question how well do we truly know those closest to us. Sherry's family pursued additional legal action against Joyce Meyer Ministries. They argued the ministry had ignored red flags in Chris's behavior and held the organization partially accountable, believing they could have intervened. Columbia, Illinois, a close-knit town, struggled with a sense of betrayal. Community leaders held vigils, emphasizing the need for vigilance against hidden domestic issues. Local organizations began offering more resources for family counseling and crisis intervention. The Coleman case became widely covered by true crime media, including documentaries and podcasts, sparking broader discussions on warning signs within troubled relationships and the psychology behind familial crimes. Despite the conviction, Chris Coleman attempted multiple appeals, maintaining his innocence. However, each appeal was denied, reinforcing the case's finality and justice for Sherry and her sons. The Coleman family case concluded with Chris Coleman being convicted for the murder of his wife Sherry and their two young sons, Gavin and Garrett, driven by his affair with Tara Lintz and fear of job consequences if he divorced. Chris attempted to stage the crime as an outside attack. However, digital evidence and forensic links exposed his guilt. Sentenced to life in prison without parole, Chris's conviction brought some relief to Sherry's family, but the tragedy left a lasting impact on the community and initiated conversations about hidden domestic issues. No. Yes, you, you have to tell me the truth, Chris. I am telling you the truth. You, you, were you involved in her death? No. Chris, hey, Chris. Chris, did you kill your wife? Chris, did you do this? Chris? The Coleman case reminds us of the unseen struggles that can lie behind closed doors, leaving us with a lasting question how well do we truly know those closest to us? around the phone he's mm -hmm. saying the neighbor came over female neighbor mm -hmm. it was a domestic she shot her husband Douglas Doug Benefield was not a man anyone expected to find embroiled in scandal born in the rural heartlands Doug grew up valuing family loyalty and integrity a former Navy veteran he later transitioned into a career as a technology consultant a profession that reflected his methodical disciplined approach to life friends and family admired his resilience and despite the personal tragedy of losing his first wife Rene, to a heart condition, Doug remained a pillar of quiet strength. Those closest to him described Doug as caring and committed, especially to his family and to his young daughter, but beneath his solid exterior, Doug's life had threads of darkness woven in, threads that few saw coming. His sudden whirlwind romance and marriage to Ashley Benefield, a striking ballerina half his age, would soon reveal complexities and contradictions that defied the steady, trustworthy image he had carefully built. Lakewood Ranch is a seemingly peaceful suburban paradise, with wide streets lined by palm trees and manicured lawns. On the surface, it's a close-knit community where neighbors greet each other with smiles, children play safely in the park, and the quiet of the evening descends like a comforting blanket. Yet, the town's polished veneer hides the murmur of secrets shared behind closed doors. It's in places like these where appearances are carefully curated that dark tales often begin. In Doug's meticulously kept home, where Ashley had only recently moved, the tension was almost palpable. The rooms were filled with an uneasy stillness, a stark contrast to the warmth that Doug's friends associated with him. Windows looked out onto the pristine lawn, but inside the air felt stifled, as if the walls themselves were holding onto words left unsaid and conflicts unresolved. Behind their serene facade, Doug and Ashley's relationship simmered with unspoken strain, a dangerous tension hidden behind smiles at public gatherings and photos on social media. Friends who once saw Doug as invincible began to notice subtle changes of withdrawn expression, a flicker of hesitation in his voice. Unknown to them, these were the first signs of a fracture widening beneath the surface, a fracture that would soon lead to tragedy. The scene was hauntingly silent, broken only by the distant hymn of crickets from the Florida night. Inside Doug's Lakewood Ranch home, chaos had unraveled. The living room bore stark evidence of a violent struggle, a coffee table overturned, shards of a broken vase scattered across the floor, and a faint smear of blood leading towards the door. The air was thick, stifling, carrying a metallic scent that mixed with the faint fragrance of Ashley's perfume lingering in the room. 
Signs of life photo frames, neatly arranged books seemed out of place, as if untouched relics in the aftermath of a storm. Doug's body lay crumpled on the floor, a position that hinted at his desperate attempt to flee. A gunshot wound to his leg, another through his arm, ultimately pierced his chest a fatal blow that would extinguish his life minutes after paramedics arrived. The position of his injuries, the scatter of blood on the walls, and the angle of the spent shell casings told a story. But it wasn't a clear one. Instead, it was a tapestry woven with violence, fear, and a mystery that demanded answers. It was Ashley herself who, moments after the shooting, stumbled across the lawn, pale-faced and shaking, to her neighbor's door. As she knocked, her hands trembled, and her breaths were shallow, uneven. When her neighbor opened the door, they found Ashley's expression locked in shock, a look that seemed both terrified and relieved. He attacked me, she managed to say, her voice a trembling whisper. The neighbor quickly dialed 911. You're on the phone, he's mm -hmm. saying the neighbor came over, female neighbor. Mm -hmm. It was a domestic, she shot her husband. As they waited, Ashley's gaze seemed distant, as though she were reliving every second of the violent struggle. Inside, the arriving officers couldn't shake the eeriness that cloaked the crime scene. The silence felt almost mocking, hanging in the air like an echo of something irrevocably wrong. One officer, catching sight of Doug's body, found his training challenged by the grim tableau before him a father, a veteran, and a husband, his life stolen in what should have been the safety of his own home. Scattered across the room were pieces of a puzzle that seemed, at first, just out of reach. Doug's cell phone lay face down on the floor, its screen cracked and dark. Close by, an overturned photo frame showed Doug and Ashley, smiling together a memory that now felt like a lie. Near the entrance, a small suitcase was packed and ready, hinting at an interrupted escape or a plan thwarted by confrontation. But perhaps the most telling detail was the trail of blood near the walls, suggesting Doug may have tried to crawl or stumble towards safety before collapsing. Ashley's story would soon come under scrutiny as forensic teams moved through the scene, noting each detail. The direction of the bullet wounds, the absence of any weapon near Doug's body, and the lack of defensive wounds on Ashley all whispered inconsistencies that would cast shadows over her claim of self-defense. The scene, rich with unsettling details and untold truths, left the investigators wondering if they were looking at a tragic case of desperation or a calculated end to a deeply troubled relationship. Detective Evelyn Hayes was assigned to the case, a seasoned investigator with an eye for hidden details and a reputation for cracking complex cases. Known around the precinct as the Seeker, Hayes had a calm, analytical approach to each investigation. She was methodical, moving through crime scenes and witness interviews like an artist studying a canvas, searching for the slightest brushstroke out of place. A veteran of the force with nearly two decades of experience, she was accustomed to the darker sides of human nature. But the Benefield case unsettled even her. She could sense that something vital was buried within the layers of Ashley and Doug's marriage, a story that needed unearthing one careful step at a time. Detective Hayes began with the first responders, recording their observations and studying their reports. Doug's injuries didn't align with Ashley's story of self-defense, none of his wounds suggested a struggle. The scattered objects and fractured belongings told a different story, and Hayes was determined to understand it. Next, she interviewed neighbors who described the relationship as strained, marked by frequent, muffled arguments. Some recalled Ashley's occasional erratic behavior, and one mentioned seeing Doug sitting alone on his porch in the middle of the night, as if something weighed on his mind. When speaking to close friends, Hayes learned that Doug had confided fears about his marriage to Ashley, though he'd been vague, stating only that he felt increasingly isolated and concerned. This provided Hayes with an early impression. Doug was unsettled but reluctant to reveal the full truth, hinting at complexities she would have to discover herself. While Ashley was the prime suspect, Hayes began to unearth other figures linked to the couple. There was Alicia, Ashley's mother, who had been present in Doug and Ashley's lives as a quiet yet influential force. Alicia had openly criticized Doug's influence over her daughter, seeing him as a controlling presence who needed to be dealt with. Another was Frank, Doug's close friend and business partner, who'd had a fallout with Ashley over her alleged attempts to cut Doug off from his friends and business dealings. These individuals presented unique motives. Alicia, with her protective instincts toward her daughter, might have influenced Ashley's behavior, while Frank could have harbored resentment over Doug's distancing himself from their shared business. Each of these relationships hinted at potential fractures in Doug's life, revealing a web of influence and tension that extended beyond the marriage. As Detective Hayes delved deeper, 
she encountered puzzling inconsistencies. Ashley's allegations of Doug's abusive behavior painted him as controlling, even dangerous. But neighbors and friends portrayed Doug as measured kind and in no way violent. During interviews, Ashley claimed Doug had attempted to poison her and often threatened her, yet Hayes found no supporting evidence for these claims, and each accusation seemed conveniently timed around custody disputes and disagreements. One of the most perplexing clues was a letter Ashley had allegedly written to a friend, outlining her fears of Doug's behavior. The letter seemed genuine, almost heartbreaking in its detail, yet when Hayes examined it further, something felt off a mention of events that didn't match Doug's confirmed whereabouts. Hayes was left wondering, was the letter a cry for help or a meticulously planned manipulation? Each lead seemed to hint at Ashley's unreliability, and Hayes grew cautious of every statement she gave, sensing that the truth was concealed within layers of misdirection. Throughout these steps, Hayes felt herself being drawn into a carefully woven puzzle of secrets, motives, and manipulation. Every suspect had a reason, every statement was veiled with potential deceit, and Hayes knew that to solve this case she'd have to separate fact from the growing labyrinth of fiction. Detective Hayes methodically peeled back the layers of each suspect, uncovering hints of unresolved grudges and personal conflicts tied to Doug's life. Alicia, Ashley's mother, projected a calm and collected demeanor, yet her protective instincts toward her daughter bordered on obsessive. Behind the polite facade aid, Alicia harbored a fierce resentment toward Doug, viewing him as an obstacle to her daughter's happiness. When questioned about Doug, her answers were deliberate, but a flicker of defensiveness betrayed a deeper tension, hinting at secrets she seemed determined to protect. Frank, Doug's business partner and old friend, was more transparent yet carried his own secrets. Doug had begun pulling away from him after marrying Ashley, and Frank hinted at a falling out over business issues that he described as personal. Frank's regret over Doug's death seemed genuine, but as Detective Hayes probed, she noticed that Frank grew uncomfortable when discussing Doug's recent decisions regarding their business. It was almost as if he knew something that he wasn't quite ready to admit, leaving Detective Hayes with a feeling that Frank, too, had motives yet to be disclosed. The interrogations grew intense as Detective Hayes pressed each suspect, searching for cracks in their composure. Alicia's voice grew icy when the detective mentioned Doug's growing distance from Ashley, her usual calm shattered for a fleeting moment as she insisted on her daughter's innocence. Hayes noted how Alicia's hands clenched, her face tense a glimpse of the controlled fury lurking beneath her surface, as she stated firmly, Doug wasn't good for her. This statement, calm but loaded, left Hayes with a growing suspicion that Alicia's involvement might be more direct than it appeared. Frank's interview was a different test of emotional control. When Hayes questioned his last conversation with Doug, his gaze shifted, avoiding her eyes. She pushed harder, asking about Doug's concerns for his marriage. He was, he was scared of losing everything, Frank muttered, finally revealing a note of guilt in his voice. It was clear he knew more than he'd let on, and each question seemed to pull at his strained loyalty to Doug, tearing away the wall he had constructed to shield his own involvement in the turmoil Doug faced. With each revelation, Detective Hayes felt the pieces of the puzzle tightening around her, forming a picture that wasn't yet complete but hinted at betrayal and manipulation far deeper than she initially expected. Alicia's resentment, Frank's hints of regret, and Ashley's unsteady narrative all pointed toward a final twist that Hayes could almost grasp but not fully see. Her instincts told her the truth was closer than ever. Still, Every new detail only made the truth more elusive, setting the stage for a climax that would bring every shadowed secret into the light. The suspects each seemed to have something to gain, but Detective Hayes still couldn't pinpoint what or who had finally pushed this ticking time bomb to explode. Detective Hayes felt the tension of the entire investigation converge in one powerful moment. She stood across from Ashley in the dimly lit interrogation room a single piece of crucial evidence resting in her hand, a phone recording taken the night of Doug's death. Hayes's voice was steady yet sharp as she pressed play. The room filled with Doug's pleading voice, followed by Ashley's calm, calculating tone a stark contrast to her claim of self-defense. You never wanted him to leave, did you? Hayes asked, her gaze piercing. Ashley's face twisted as the recording played, her hands clenching against the table. Hayes continued, revealing the trajectory of the bullet wounds in the absence of defensive marks. Every piece of evidence, the broken frame, the packed suitcase, the hidden letter clicked into place, forming a portrait of manipulation and control. Ashley's calm mask began to slip, and for the first time she looked genuinely unsettled. Her gaze darted around the room as Hayes continued laying out the truth, each word a hammer blow breaking through her composure. 
The weight of her choices seemed to settle visibly on her shoulders as she shifted, lips pressed into a thin line. Hayes, unwavering, leaned forward, her voice intense and unrelenting. It wasn't fear that made you pull the trigger. It was control. You were willing to do anything to keep it. A gasp came from Ashley's mother, Alicia, seated on the opposite side of the one-way glass, her face pale as the realization dawned. Ashley glanced toward the mirror, and for a fleeting second, an expression of bitterness surfaced then acceptance. The quiet betrayal that Hayes had suspected from the beginning was confirmed, leaving a lingering tension in the room. The final act of Ashley's long, desperate quest for dominance. With an icy, almost detached voice, Ashley finally admitted her motive, though she avoided eye contact with the detective. I did what I had to, she whispered, her tone stripped of emotion. For her, Doug was an obstacle his wishes, his plans, his presence, all challenges to the carefully constructed life she envisioned for herself and her daughter. In her world, Doug's control over her life was intolerable and she was determined to sever it, no matter the cost. Hayes's heart sank as she watched Ashley's confession, an admission driven not by regret but by a need to assert control. She knew that this was no heat-of-the-moment decision but a cold, calculated act. Born from deeply rooted resentment, the room fell silent, the truth stark and unsettling, with each person processing the web of betrayal, jealousy, and desperation that had finally pushed Ashley to act. The murder of Douglas Benefield left a deep scar on his family in the Lakewood Ranch community. His daughter, too young to understand, was left with a legacy marked by tragedy, a loss she would one day come to realize had roots in manipulation and control. Doug's closest friends, including Frank, struggled with a sense of betrayal, questioning if they had missed signs that might have prevented this outcome. The community, once captivated by the seemingly beautiful romance between Doug and Ashley, felt disturbed, now painfully aware of the darkness that had lurked beneath the surface. Doug's extended family grieved not just the loss of a loved one, but the brutal betrayal that led to his death. As they grappled with their sorrow, the reality of how Doug's kindness was exploited left a wound deeper than the crime itself. In the courtroom, Ashley maintained a distant, almost emotionless demeanor as the sentence was read. Her expression was flat, devoid of remorse or guilt a striking contrast to the devastated family members seated in the gallery. She stared ahead, silent, resolute, as if the act of taking Doug's life had justified her sense of control and freedom. The brief glimmers of vulnerability she had shown during her confession were gone, replaced by a cold detachment. She faced justice not with repentance but with the same steely resolve that had driven her to the crime. Detective Hayes felt a mix of satisfaction and sorrow as the case concluded. She had uncovered the truth, piecing together a puzzle others might have overlooked, but the story weighed heavily on her. Cases of betrayal like this where trust was twisted into violence always left an ache. For Hayes, this wasn't just about solving a murder. It was about seeing the cost of manipulation, the destruction caused by one person's desperate need for control. She wondered if Doug's life could have taken a different path or if this outcome had been inevitable from the moment they met. Standing outside the courthouse, Hayes allowed herself a moment of quiet reflection, her mind lingering on the lives shattered by a single, brutal decision. As Detective Hayes walked away, a line echoed in her mind, capturing the weight of the case and the secrets it had unearthed. Some secrets, once revealed, change everything forever. The story of Douglas Bennyfield was a stark reminder that darkness often lies hidden in the most unexpected places, waiting only for a spark to ignite a devastating inferno. Is this where the body of East Point teen Zion Foster is buried? Did you, uh, pull forward? So you were side by side? Okay. Zion Foster was a 17-year-old girl from East Point, Michigan. She was a bright young girl with a promising future, living in a small, close-knit community with her mother. Zion was the only child of her mother, and they shared a strong bond. Growing up, Zion was known for her friendly and kind nature. She was always willing to lend a helping hand and had a close group of friends and family who adored her. Zion lived a typical teenage life, attending high school, spending time with her friends, and being a loving daughter. Despite being the only child, she was independent and mature for her age. She had dreams of doing something meaningful with her life, and her mother supported her in every way possible. Zion's mother raised her with love, teaching her values of kindness and responsibility. One of the key figures in Zion's life was her cousin, Jalen Brazier. Jalen and Zion had grown up together, sharing family events and spending a lot of time together. Like many cousins, they had a strong family bond. 
Jalen, being a bit older, had always looked out for Zion, and Zion trusted him. To Zion, Jalen wasn't just a cousin, he was like an older brother, someone she could rely on. The two had shared many moments of laughter and joy, and Zion always felt safe around him. Zion's life seemed normal on the outside, she was a typical teenage girl navigating school friendships and family relationships. But underneath that surface, no one could have predicted that her life would take a tragic turn, and the person she trusted the most would be at the center of it all. What happened next shocked her community and left her mother heartbroken. The girl who had been so full of life suddenly became the focus of a heartbreaking crime story, with her cousin Jalen playing a central role in the events that followed. The trust and love Zion had for her cousin would be shattered, and her family would be left searching for answers in the most tragic of circumstances. Zion Foster's story is one that resonates with many a young girl with her whole life ahead of her, taken too soon in a way no one could have imagined. Her memory is a reminder of how fragile life can be and how the people closest to us can sometimes bring the most unexpected pain. As we dive deeper into the events surrounding her disappearance and the role her cousin played, it becomes clear that this is not just a story about loss but also about trust, betrayal, and the ripple effect of tragedy. Zion's community continues to mourn her loss and her story remains a reminder of the dangers that can sometimes lurk in the most familiar places. Here it goes. When Zion Foster went missing, it immediately sent shockwaves through her family and community. As a 17-year-old girl from East Point, Michigan, she was known for being responsible and respectful, making her sudden disappearance all the more alarming. The search for Zion quickly escalated into an intense investigation where every clue lead and suspicion was examined in a bid to find the truth. But as the investigation unfolded, it soon became clear that her disappearance wasn't as simple as it first appeared. In fact, it would uncover a dark and tragic betrayal at the hands of someone Z entrusted the most her cousin, Jalen Brazier. When Zion didn't come home, her mother's worst fears began to surface. Zion had always been reliable, and her failure to return home was unusual. Desperate for answers, her mother reported her missing, launching a full-scale investigation by local authorities. The police immediately started working on the case, focusing first on Zion's last known whereabouts, and who she had been with before she disappeared. Friends and family were questioned, phone records were checked, and anyone who may have had contact with Zion was interviewed. The first major break in the case came when police learned that the last person to have seen Zion was her cousin, Jalen Brazier. Jalen had always been close to Zion, so it seemed natural that she might have been spending time with him. At first, Jalen claimed that they had hung out, but after that, they went their separate ways, and he didn't know what had happened to her. You guys mix up your weeds, you grow up, you guys start smoking, you're just watching TV, just chilling? Yeah. She was telling me about um, how her mom, their relationship's a lot better than it was the last time she talked to us. And about her boyfriend, about prom, um, the job and everything, and how she's worked on getting an apartment and everything. His initial story seemed plausible, and there was little reason to suspect him. But as the investigation progressed, Jalen's behavior and inconsistencies in his statements began to raise red flags for the police. I was trying with psychedelics and acid, and okay. I think that's what killed her. Do you? Yes. Did you have like a freaking momentary, like, didn't know what you were doing moment? No, no. She also. I... As authorities dug deeper into Jalen Brazier's involvement, they started noticing cracks in his story. The timeline he provided didn't quite match up, and his alibi began to fall apart. Friends and family members who were questioned reported that Jalen had seemed unusually nervous and agitated in the days following Zion's disappearance. This led investigators to begin focusing more on Jalen, trying to piece together his movements and interactions with Zion on the day she went missing. My phone records became a critical piece of evidence. Jalen's phone showed that he had been in the area where Zion was not known to be, and data indicated that he had driven around in suspicious patterns after the time Zion was last seen. The police began to think that perhaps Jalen wasn't being completely honest about what had happened. When Jalen was brought in for more questioning, his story shifted slightly. He started to become evasive, and the detectives noticed that his answers seemed rehearsed or inconsistent. The mounting evidence in Jalen's strange behavior painted a picture that was becoming harder to ignore Jalen wasn't just a witness in Zion's disappearance, he was a suspect. It wasn't long before police decided to take a bold step. They arrested Jalen Brazier. Never here, but her location is she here. I'm sorry, but she was never here. I don't know. But anyway, I have cameras to show. I think she was never here. 
The decision to arrest him wasn't made lightly, but it became clear that he knew more about Zion's disappearance than he was letting on. Once in custody under the pressure of police interrogation, Jalen cracked. He admitted that something had gone horribly wrong on the night Zion went missing, and what he revealed left everyone stunned. Jalen confessed that Zion had died that night. According to him, it was an accident. But the details surrounding her death were vague and suspicious. Jalen claimed that after Zion's death, he panicked. He didn't know what to do, so instead of calling for help or notifying the authorities, he made the decision to hide her body. This revelation sent shockwaves through Zion's family and the community, who couldn't believe that the person responsible for her disappearance was someone so close to her. Despite Jalen's confession, there was still one critical element missing Zion's body. Without a body, the full story of what happened to her that night remained unclear. Jalen admitted that he had disposed of her body in a dumpster in Detroit, Michigan. The police immediately launched a massive search effort, combing through landfills and waste disposal sites in hopes of recovering Zion's remains. This part of the investigation was grueling and heartbreaking. The thought of Zion's body being discarded like trash was a devastating reality that her family had to face. Weeks went by, and despite the tireless efforts of search teams, Zion's body was never recovered. This left her family in a state of torment. Without her body, they were unable to properly mourn or say their goodbyes. The investigation continued to focus on piecing together the full scope of what had happened, but the absence of physical evidence made things more difficult. Once Jalen Brazier was formally charged, the legal proceedings began. Jalen was charged with several crimes, including lying to the police during the investigation and tampering with evidence. The court case drew significant attention, as people were eager to see justice served for Zion. During the trial, Jalen maintained that Zion's death had been an accident, but the prosecution pushed for a more severe sentence, arguing that Jalen's actions after her death showed a complete disregard for human life. The defense tried to paint Jalen as someone who had made a terrible mistake in a moment of panic. They argued that he had not intended to harm Zion and that his actions, while wrong, were not premeditated. But the prosecution wasn't swayed. They highlighted the fact that Jalen had lied repeatedly to the police and had gone to extreme lengths to cover up what had happened, even going as far as to dispose of Zion's body in a dumpster, showing a disturbing lack of remorse. As the case reached its conclusion, Jalen Brazier was sentenced to prison for his role in Zion's disappearance and death. For Zion's family, the outcome was bittersweet. While Jalen's confession and sentencing brought some measure of closure, the pain of losing Zion remained fresh. Her mother, who had been a vocal advocate throughout the investigation, continued to fight for justice for her daughter, even as the case faded from the headlines. The story of Zion Foster's disappearance and death left an indelible mark on her community. It was a reminder of how fragile life can be and how betrayal can come from the most unexpected places. The investigation into Zion's case highlighted the importance of persistence, as it was the relentless efforts of law enforcement and Zion's family that ultimately led to Jalen's arrest and confession. It also underscored the need for vigilance, as Zion's family and friends struggled to make sense of how someone so close to her could have been responsible for such a tragic outcome. Zion Foster's memory lives on not just as a victim of a terrible crime, but as a symbol of the love and strength of her family. Her mother, in particular, has continued to advocate for missing and exploited children, hoping that Zion's story can help others avoid the same fate. The case remains a painful reminder of the dangers that sometimes lie close to home and the devastating impact that a single moment of panic or poor judgment can have on countless lives. As her family moves forward, they do so with Zion's memory in their hearts, knowing that while justice has been served in some ways, the loss of their beloved daughter is something they will carry with them forever. The climax of Zion Foster's tragic story came when the investigation reached a critical point. As authorities closed in on the truth, the tension surrounding her disappearance escalated. Zion's family, especially her mother, had been living in a state of agonizing uncertainty for weeks. Every passing day without answers weighed heavily on their hearts. But as the pieces of the puzzle started falling into place, the truth about what happened to Zion would come crashing down, leaving everyone involved in a state of disbelief and heartbreak. From the moment her cousin Jalen Brazier was identified as the last person to have seen Zion, the investigation had taken a sharp turn. Initial interviews with Jalen had been casual he was family, after all, and no one suspected him. But it was the subtle inconsistencies in his statements that started raising suspicions. At first, Jalen maintained that he and Zion had spent time together before she left to go home. He claimed he had no idea what had happened to her after that. However, as detectives dug deeper, the inconsistencies became glaring. Jalen's timeline didn't add up, 
and the evidence that followed would paint a much darker picture. As pressure mounted during the investigation, Jalen Brazier began to crack under the weight of the truth. It was during an intense police interrogation that the breaking point came. Faced with mounting evidence, Jalen finally admitted that Ziaim was no longer alive. His confession was shocking and devastating. He claimed that her death had been an accident. According to him, something had gone horribly wrong, and instead of calling for help or seeking assistance, Jalen panicked. The panic and fear of being caught led him to make a series of decisions that would forever change the lives of Zion's family and community. Jalen's confession to Zion's death came with a cold and chilling twist. After she had died, instead of notifying the authorities, Jalen chose to cover up the incident. He admitted to disposing of Zion's body in a dumpster, an action that not only shocked detectives but also left Zion's family reeling from the horror of such a cruel and disrespectful act. The thought of Zion's remains being discarded as if she were nothing more than garbage was a devastating blow to her mother and loved ones. What made the situation even worse was Jalen's claim that her death was an accident, but he provided very little detail about how it happened. His vague and evasive answers frustrated investigators and left Zion's family with more questions than answers. Was Zion's death truly an accident, or was there something more sinister behind it? Unfortunately, Jalen's refusal to fully cooperate left the true nature of Zion's death shrouded in mystery. With Jalen's confession, the investigation entered its final, most critical phase the search for Zion's body. Jalen led authorities to a landfill in Detroit where he claimed to have dumped Zion's body, but recovering her remains would prove to be an almost impossible task. The area where Zion's body was supposedly discarded had already undergone weeks of waste collection, making it nearly impossible to pinpoint where her remains might be. Search teams worked tirelessly, combing through the landfill in hopes of finding any trace of Zion. The physical and emotional toll on Zion's family during this time was immense. Each day spent searching was a painful reminder that they may never have the closure they so desperately sought. For Zion's mother, the thought of never being able to properly lay her daughter to rest was a torment unlike any other. Despite the extensive search efforts, Zion's body was never recovered. The absence of her physical remains left a lingering sense of unfinished business, a hollow ache that Zion's family and the community felt deeply. Her mother's worst fears had been realized her daughter was gone, and the person responsible was someone she had trusted, someone from within their own family. The courtroom became the stage for the final showdown in Zion Foster's case. Jalen Brazier, now a confessed criminal, faced charges for his role in Zion's death and the subsequent cover-up. The prosecution pushed hard, highlighting the cruelty of Jalen's actions and the deep betrayal he had inflicted upon his own family. The defense, however, argued that Jalen was a young man who had made a terrible mistake and that Zion's death was not intentional. They portrayed him as panicked and overwhelmed in a tragic situation, hoping to soften the judgment against him. But for Zion's family, especially her mother, no amount of courtroom arguments could undo the pain that had been caused. The betrayal was too deep and the loss too profound. Jalen's sentencing offered some measure of justice, but it was a bittersweet conclusion. While Jalen would spend time behind bars, it didn't bring Zion back, and it didn't provide the closure that her mother longed for. The climax of Zion Foster's case was a tragic one, marked by betrayal, heartbreak, and unanswered questions. Uh, Zion's family was left to grapple with the painful reality that someone they had trusted had taken her life, whether intentionally or not. The haunting truth of the case was that Zion's body would never be found, leaving her family without the ability to properly say goodbye. In the end, Zion Foster's story serves as a stark reminder of how fragile trust can be and how even those closest to us can harbor dark secrets. The climax of her case wasn't just about solving a mystery or delivering justice, it was about confronting the raw and painful reality of loss, betrayal, and the irreversible consequences of one man's decision to cover up the truth. Hi, is that Ross? Hi, it is Ross, yeah. Hi Ross, my name's Mia, I'm a police officer with uh, Warwickshire Police. Hello. Um, we've just come to your mum and dad's house. Um, we're just looking for Megan. She's been reported missing. In the summer of 2021, Megan knew Burrow disappeared just days before turning 24. She had left her home on a Friday night to meet someone she trusted, someone who had shared personal things with her and earned her trust. Megan had often played the role of a confidante offering support, but this time she placed her trust in the wrong person. Newneden, a market town east of Birmingham, is the largest town in Warwickshire, England. It evolved from a medieval village into an industrial town focused on coal mining. Today, the community is known for its friendly and welcoming atmosphere. On Friday, August 6th, 
2021, 23 year old Megan knew Burroff left her family home around 7 30 p.m. She had told her mother, Elaine, that she was going to meet someone for a walk. Megan didn't put much thought into her outfit that night and didn't wear any makeup, suggesting she was comfortable with who she was meeting and where she was going. Leaving for a few hours in the evening wasn't unusual for Megan. Her father, Anthony, expected her to be back in just a couple of hours. But by 9.30 that night, Megan still hadn't returned. Throughout the night, Elaine and Anthony sent messages to her on different platforms, growing increasingly worried. By the next day, noon to be exact, they reported her missing. Elaine vividly remembered the last conversation in the kitchen, telling Megan, be safe, see you soon. Megan, or Meg as she was affectionately called, was born on one of the hottest days of the year in August 1997. She was the middle child between her older sister Claire and younger brother John. The three siblings were very close, growing up together in their family home in Nunatan. From a young age, Megan developed a love for dancing and animals. She always had pets, hamsters, rabbits, and eventually a dog named Frank. Her best friends were the same kids she had grown up with from preschool through adulthood. As an adult, Megan was successful in her career. She worked in human resources at a brick manufacturing company called Evestock Bricks. Her co-workers described her as kind and always willing to help. According to her sister Claire, Megan left that Friday night to meet a romantic interest 30-year-old Ross Malam. They had met through work, where Megan was in HR and Ross worked as a brickmaker. Claire shared that Megan only had good things to say about Ross, like how he would send sweet messages in the morning, greeting her with good morning, beautiful. However, Claire didn't know much else about Ross, as Megan hadn't been seeing him for long, though they had known each other for a few years. One thing the family was certain of when Megan left the house that Friday, she was in a cheerful mood. The Warwickshire police tracked Megan's white Citroen C3 using an automatic number plate recognition system. A camera had picked up her car just 30 minutes after she left home, around 9.50 p.m. Initially, the family felt some relief it seemed Megan had been driving around late that night. However, their relief was short-lived as she still wasn't answering her phone, and every call went straight to voicemail. To retrace her steps, the police visited Ross Malam's home. He lived in Colshill, about a 40-minute drive north of the new Burrow family home. The officers spoke to his parents first, but Ross wasn't there. He was at a pub in the nearby town of Loughborough. A police officer managed to reach him over the phone. Hi, is that Ross? Hi, it is Ross, yeah. Hi, Ross. My name's Mia. I'm a police officer with uh, Warwickshire Police. Hello. Um, we've just come to your mum and dad's house. Um, we're just looking for Megan. She's been reported missing. After gathering this information, the police decided to visit Ross' home in Colshill while he was still out drinking. What they discovered inside his house set off alarm bells immediately. The living room showed signs of a struggle with items knocked over. There was a wet spot on the floor, which Ross had apparently tried to clean up, claiming he had spilled coffee. But the officers suspected otherwise. In the hallway leading to the front door, they noticed dark smears on the baseboards, which they believed could be blood. The evidence suggested something far more sinister than a spilled drink. Realizing they might be dealing with a crime scene, Warwickshire police acted swiftly. If Megan was still alive, they needed to find her urgently. Ross Malam was quickly tracked down and arrested on suspicion of kidnapping. The officer informed I'm DC Gallagher from Warwickshire Police. Um, at this moment in time, we have reason to suspect your involvement in the disappearance of Megan Newbury. Uh, and as a result, I'm arresting you on suspicion of kidnap. So you do not have to say anything. No matter how you defence, you don't mention one question or something which you may later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. So I'm just going to pop some handcuffs on you, alright? You can, I'll put these on first. Yeah, that's fine, no worries. Can you feel that, yeah? Yeah. We've got a bit of room in it. Okay. okay. In relation to Megan, can you tell us where she is? You got something in your ear? What is it? Okay. Ross, in relation to Megan, can you tell us where she is? Say again. 
talk down the police station. Can you tell us? Can you tell us here? Just quietly. Um, just Woodhouse Eaves. Woodhouse Eaves. What is that? Near Loughborough. What is it though? It's what kind of location is it? It's on Charlie Road. Charlie Road. Whereabouts? In the Labour. In the Labour. Okay. It's not coming this tomorrow morning. Is she alive? No. Okay. Right, do you want to come with us? Yeah. The police immediately headed to the location Ross mentioned. Officer Thomas Wright, a Warkshire police dog handler, was sent to search the area. It was well past midnight when he arrived, joined by officers from Leicestershire Police and a helicopter scanning the area with spotlights. About 100 yards from their location, they noticed a patch of grass that looked like it had been disturbed, located near a stone wall covered in thick greenery. As Thomas shone his flashlight into the overgrown bushes, he saw what appeared to be a piece of black fabric hidden under the leaves. As they continued searching, officers found Megan's body, just as Ross had said, in a lay-by on Charlie Road. It was an area where cars could pull off the road not far from the village of Woodhouse Eaves, near Laffero. Megan was partially dressed, and it appeared her throat had been cut. She lay there lifeless. The postmortem revealed that Megan had suffered 14 cuts to her neck, but the cause of death was strangulation. The cuts had been made after she was already dead. Megan had been just four days away from celebrating her 24th birthday. At 2 a.m. on Sunday, the police found Megan's white Citroen C3. Blood matching hers was discovered inside the car on the passenger side, as well as on the exterior. Nearby, they also found a glove, which had both Megan's and Ross D.N. on it. Despite not having a driver's license, Ross had driven Megan's car to dump her stew spose and bue spose of the evidence. Megan's phone was later found in dense undergrowth near Hermitage Road, in the village of Whitwick, about a mile from Ross' home. It was clear that Ross had thrown the phone away while driving toward the location where he had left Megan's body. In the month leading up to her death, Megan and Ross had exchanged over 3,500 messages. Many of these messages revealed Ross' insecurities, especially regarding his struggle with impotence, which he blamed on medication for his ADHD. As their relationship developed, their conversations became more intimate, but over time, Ross' tone grew increasingly aggressive. In one of their earlier meetings, they had planned to be intimate, but nothing physical had happened. The next time they met was at Ross' house in Coleshill the last time Megan was seen alive. GPS data from Megan's phone helped the investigators piece together a timeline of that tragic night. Ross Malam had made several mistakes while trying to cover up Megan's murder. He didn't turn off her phone before throwing it into a hedge near a public footpath on Charlie Road. But his most crucial mistake came when he was caught on Kift at 9.51 p.m. at the Loughborough College Fitness Center. The cameras captured him pulling over and throwing away various items, including some of Megan's clothes, into two bins. He was also seen changing his clothes and discarding the blood-stained ones, along with a towel and linen he had used to clean up after the crime. Among the items thrown away were Megan's glasses, later found bent and damaged as if they had been crushed in a fist. After getting rid of the evidence, Ross abandoned Megan's car and called a taxi to take him home, arriving around 10.45 p.m. What made his actions even more chilling was that during the time he was disposing of her body and trying to hide the crime, he continued sending Megan sweet, affectionate messages. He texted her as if everything was normal, despite having just left her body by the side of the road. Investigators pieced together the timeline and concluded that Ross had likely strangled Megan shortly after she arrived at his house, around 8 p.m. He then cut her throat multiple times with a knife from the kitchen, possibly to ensure she was dead. Ross sent his first message to Megan's phone shortly after leaving the house with her body in the car, writing, You're amazing, followed by another message asking if she got home safely. His internet search history following the voicemail painted a disturbing picture of his mindset. He started looking up information about notorious serial killers, including Levi Belfield, one of England's most dangerous criminals. It appeared Ross eventually fell asleep after these searches. By 6.30 the next morning, he resumed his online activity, searching again for killers and even pornography. Once in police custody, Ross admitted to killing Megan but claimed it was manslaughter, not murder. 
He insisted that he didn't intend for things to go that far. However, the Crown Prosecution Service disagreed and charged him with murder. In October 2022, his case went to trial at Leicester Crown Court. The prosecutor, John Keek, argued that Ross had attacked Meghan in a fit of rage after being unable to perform sexually. This wasn't the first time this had happened. During a previous outing, the couple had planned to be intimate, but Ross couldn't follow through. Meghan had been supportive and understanding, but Ross felt humiliated. After that incident, Ross purchased erectile dysfunction medication online and invited Meghan over when his parents were out. But when things didn't go as planned again, he snapped. According to the prosecution, Ross strangled her and then cut her throat in anger. Ross's defense, however, painted a different picture. His legal team presented witnesses who testified that Ross had confided in them about abuse he suffered as a child. The most shocking revelation was Ross's claim that one of his abusers was a man named Stephen Bedman, a convicted killer sentenced to 35 years in prison for the 2015 murder of Kaylai Highwood. That case had been highly publicized as Kaylai, a 15-year-old girl, had been groomed online by Bedman's neighbor, Luke Harlow, before being killed by Bedman. Bedman, who had since died in prison, was named by Ross as one of the individuals who abused him. Ross claimed that these traumatic experiences had a significant impact on his behavior and that on the night Megan came over, those memories resurfaced, leading to the tragic events. He explained that he lost control and attacked Megan when she tried to touch him intimately. The encounter triggered an episode of post-traumatic stress disorder which he claimed was linked to the abuse he had suffered from Beedman. Ross testified that once triggered, he couldn't stop himself from strangling her. With apparent remorse, he told the jury that Megan was one of the few people he trusted with his painful secrets. She had been a source of comfort for him, offering hugs and never judging him. He described the moment of the attack, saying, I pulled away, but she held me close and said, Come here. She was facing me, and I moved toward her. I wasn't angry at her, though that's the thing. She had never done anything to make me want to hurt her. After a six-week trial, it took the jury less than 90 minutes to find Ross Malum guilty of murder. Megan's family, overcome with emotion, cried tears of relief as Judge Philip Head Keek sentenced Ross to life in prison, with a minimum of 23 years before he would be eligible for parole. Megan's family, heartbroken, expressed how their lives have been shattered. They described Megan as the glue that held their family together, and her death left a devastating void. Her brother later shared, we are a very close family, and Megan was the one who brought us all together. Our lives have been torn apart over this past year. I know how hard it has been for my parents and sister to sit through the trial, listening to the lies spun by someone Megan trusted, someone who clearly had no love for her at all. Now, we're the ones serving a life sentence. He continued, no amount of time in prison will bring Megan back. We have to keep going with our lives as best we can, but Megan will always be in our thoughts. She was about to buy her first home and was so excited about the future. She was yeah, ready to start the next would... chapter of her life. Megan's that, father, yeah. Anthony Newborough, <laughs> spoke to the media after the trial, sharing how his okay. daughter always saw the best in people, which in led her to trust to the man who took her life. He said, she believed Megan. she could help him, but instead she lost her life trying to do so. When Megan was younger, she had made a list of things she wanted to achieve in her life. One of her dreams was to train for and run a marathon. In November, to honor her memory, 50 of her family members and friends came together for a 5,000 park run to support the White Ribbon Charity, which works to end violence against women and girls. They raised over Peace 3000, and with the collective effort of all participants, they completed the distance of a full marathon, just as Megan had always hoped to do. At Megan's funeral, donations were made to the Dogs Trust, one of her favorite charities. In her memory, the family also established the Megan New Borough Foundation, which aims to support the causes and passions that were close to Megan's heart. This was the heartbreaking story of Megan New Borough, a young woman who lost her life while trying to help someone she believed she could trust. Hi everyone, my name is Sunny, and today we're diving into a heartbreaking case. Julia Simmons had been living with Stephen Nicholas, a divorced day trader, in his three-bedroom house just outside of Portland, Oregon. Julia explained that she and Stephen initially met online while she was searching for a rental. At first, Stephen came across as kind and charming, which made Julia comfortable sharing a home with him. While the two were living together, Stephen met Julia's daughter, Rhonda, who was 20 years old at the time. 
Stephen, who was 10 years older than her, found Rhonda irresistible. Her beauty captivated him, but what really drew him in was her amazing personality. To Stephen's surprise, Rhonda also seemed to develop feelings for him, and before long, the two started dating. Their relationship quickly became more serious. Eventually, Rhonda moved out of her mother's place and settled into Stephen's condo. During this time, Stephen also grew close to Rhonda's family, especially her younger sisters, Melanie and Tessa. When Stephen and Rhonda began dating, Tessa was only nine years old. She loved spending time with Stephen, who she thought was fun and playful, often treating him more like a friend than an adult. Over the years, Rhonda and Stephen stayed together, becoming a committed couple, though they never officially married. This was something Rhonda often thought about. Her close friends knew how much she wanted to get married, and they believed she was holding on the hope that Stephen would propose. Stephen always assured her that they would get married, claiming it would happen in the summer of 2009, according to his schedule. Though marriage eluded them, the couple did have a daughter together. Becoming a mother transformed Rhonda's life. Her little girl quickly became the center of her world, and Rhonda cherished every moment she spent with her. So even though being a mom brought her immense joy, Rhonda also felt a longing to return to her modeling career. However, according to Stephen, after giving birth, Rhonda struggled with her self-image. He said she became the heaviest she'd ever been and that it made her feel unattractive. To help her regain her confidence, they decided to hike the top 25 trails in Oregon as a way to lose weight and bond. Stephen claimed their relationship was doing better than ever during this time. They rarely argued, and he felt that their bond had grown stronger. But Rhonda's friends painted a much darker picture. She had confided in them about Stephen's abusive behavior. On one occasion, Rhonda even took photos of bruises on her back, using a mirror, documenting injuries she said were caused by a fight with Stephen. On March 16, 2009, Stephen and Rhonda, who was 23 years old at the time, went hiking on the Eagle Creek Trail. As they walked along the path, Rhonda snapped a photo of Stephen with her phone. Before leaving for the hike, she had sent her mom a text, joking, he's either going to give me a succumbs a cliff, ha ha ha. At first, the weather was perfect and the two enjoyed their time outdoors, but Stephen later claimed that Rhonda began acting strangely during the hike. He said she asked him what would happen if something ever happened to her and whether he would take care of their daughter. Stephen reassured her that he would. As clouds started to gather and the weather took a turn for the worse, Stephen suggested they head back. But instead of returning, Stephen said Rhonda suddenly wrapped a towel around her shoulders, declaring herself Supergirl. She then started running down the narrow, slippery trail. According to Stephen, he watched in horror as Rhonda lost her footing and fell off the side of the trail, plunging 150 feet into the ravine below. Desperate to help her, Stephen said he climbed down to the spot where she had landed. He tried to call 911, but he had no cell service. With no way to get help, Stephen claimed he had no choice but to leave Rhonda behind and hike back to the trailhead to call for help. Later that day, rescue workers arrived and recovered Rhonda's body from the ravine. So ever, Rhonda's family became suspicious of Stephen's behavior. They noticed that he didn't seem to show much emotion during her memorial service, which raised doubts about how he truly felt. But Stephen insisted this wasn't true. He claimed he was devastated and cried constantly. He explained that when he feels deep sadness, he tends to isolate himself and prefers to be alone. Not long after Rhonda's death, Stephen packed up his belongings and moved across Oregon to be closer to his family, taking his daughter with him. So this sudden move only fueled Rhonda's family's suspicions. They couldn't help but wonder what really happened between Stephen and Rhonda during those final moments on the trail. Then, in 2006, Stephen made an unexpected decision. He relocated to China, bringing his daughter along. They settled in Wuxi, a city located about 75 miles from Shanghai. Stephen had previously lived in China during his first marriage and had grown fond of the culture and the people there. This new chapter in Stephen's life only deepened the mystery surrounding what happened to Rhonda on that fateful day. So while living in China, Stephen found work teaching English to Chinese business professionals. So daughter Rhonda quickly adjusted to her new surroundings. Within just two months of moving, she had already become fluent in Mandarin. Both Stephen and his daughter seemed to thrive in their new life abroad. During his time in China, Stephen met a woman named Landy Yin Yan, and the two fell in love. Landy built a strong relationship with Stephen's daughter, stepping in as a mother figure. Stephen appreciated the love and care Landy gave his daughter, embracing her new role with open arms. After dating for a year, Stephen decided to propose to Landy, and to his delight, she accepted. In February 2015, Stephen and his daughter flew back to the United States, 
preparing for their wedding. The couple planned to have two ceremonies, one in the U.S. and one in China to celebrate with both of their families and friends. Stephen and his daughter landed in San Francisco, arriving one day before Landy's flight. However, as they disembarked from the plane in San Francisco to catch their connecting flight to Oregon, things took a strange turn. An officer approached Stephen, telling him there was an issue with his luggage. Stephen had no idea that this routine encounter would spiral into a life-altering event. Within minutes, police officers arrived and separated Stephen from his daughter. What Stephen didn't realize was that, all along, detectives had been quietly investigating Rhonda's death. Suspicious details surrounding her fall from Eagle Creek Trail had kept the investigation alive for years. So behind the scenes, Rhonda's mother had played a crucial role in keeping the case open. She persistently contacted detectives, demanding updates and urging them not to let her daughter's death go unresolved. As a result, detectives eventually reached a conclusion Stephen was responsible for Rhonda's death. So at the San Francisco airport, Stephen was arrested for murder and extradited to Oregon to face charges. Stephen later claimed he felt like he was dreaming. He hoped that, at any moment, he would wake up in China, safe and sound with Landy by his side. But this was no nightmare, this was reality. Initially, Stephen's bail was set at $2 million, leaving him stuck in jail for 14 months as he awaited trial. Eventually, a judge lowered his bail to $250,000, and Stephen's attorney was able to secure his release with a bond. Once out of jail, Stephen was fitted with an ankle monitor, restricting his movements while he awaited trial. When Rhonda's family heard about Stephen's arrest, they were overwhelmed with relief. Her mother, in particular, couldn't hold back her emotions and burst into tears upon learning the news. After years of heartbreak, the family finally felt that justice for Rhonda was within reach. Following Stephen's release on bail, his defense team went to work. His attorney and investigators visited the Eagle Creek Trail, determined to prove that Rhonda's fall had been a tragic accident, not foul play. They aimed to convince the court that Stephen had not pushed her and that her death was purely accidental. Stephen's attorney emphasized that the Eagle Creek Trail is one of the most popular hiking spots in the Columbia River Gorge, known for its scenic beauty and challenging paths. During the hearings, the medical examiner who had performed Rhonda's autopsy provided key findings, so the examiner revealed that all of Rhonda's injuries were located below her waist, a crucial piece of information for the defense. Using this as discovery, Stephen's lawyers argued that Rhonda had fallen feet first, which aligned with the theory that her death was an accident. They claimed that had she been pushed, her body would have tumbled head over heels, leading to injuries on other parts of her body. The defense also introduced evidence from Rhonda's therapy sessions. While these notes confirmed that Rhonda struggled with depression, they made no mention of suicidal thoughts. However, Rhonda had described her relationship with Stephen as loveless, a fact the defense used to support their argument that she may have taken her own life. Stephen's legal team suggested that Rhonda's depression combined with dissatisfaction in her relationship, could have led her to end her own life on the trail. They hoped to cast doubt on the prosecution's theory that Stephen had deliberately pushed Rhonda, causing her fatal injuries. Stephen further claimed that Rhonda had battled depression long before they met. He alleged that she had tried to take her own life on multiple occasions. However, Rhonda's family strongly denied these allegations, accusing Stephen of lying to shift the blame away from himself. They were convinced that Stephen was trying to protect himself by falsely portraying Rhonda as suicidal. Stephen also asserted that Rhonda had struggled with substance abuse from a young age, experimenting with drugs since she was 12 years old. So the medical examiner's report contradicted this claim. It found only trace amounts of marijuana in her system, along with prescription medication she had been taking to manage anxiety and postpartum depression. As the hearings continued, more unsettling evidence emerged, further complicating the case. So disturbing revelations shed new light on Stephen's involvement in Rhonda's tragic death, leaving everyone wondering what truly happened that day on the Eagle Creek Trail. It was discovered that Stephen had been involved in a romantic relationship with Rhonda's younger sister, Melanie, who was only 16 years old at the time. This revelation shocked everyone, as Stephen was in his 30s and Melanie was still a minor. The prosecution argued that this illicit relationship could have given Stephen a motive to kill Rhonda. Once Rhonda found out about the affair, tensions grew between the couple, possibly driving Stephen to murder her to cover up his actions. After Stephen's arrest for Rhonda's death, he was also indicted on two counts of third-degree sexual assault and three counts of third-degree sodomy, all related to his involvement with Melanie Kesto, Rhonda's sister. While awaiting trial for Rhonda's murder, Stephen pleaded guilty in 2005 to two counts of sexual abuse. 
In a signed statement, he admitted, I had sexual intercourse with Melanie Casto twice. However, Stephen later claimed that this confession wasn't true and said he was pressured into signing it. He insisted that the only reason he took the plea deal was to avoid legal complications, hoping to fight for custody of his daughter. According to him, he was desperate to get his daughter back. The prosecution, however, painted a different picture. They argued that Stephen's relationship with Melanie had lasted over four years. He later confessed in court that he did, in fact, have a sexual relationship with Rhonda's teenage sister. One piece of evidence presented was a text message from Rhonda to Melanie, sent just before the tragic hike at Eagle Creek. In the message, Rhonda called Stephen a piece of garbage and accused him of manipulating Melanie to hurt her emotionally. Rhonda's mother testified that her daughter knew Stephen was trying to create conflict between her and Melanie. Despite this, Rhonda deeply loved her little sister and wanted to repair their relationship. The state also revealed troubling details about Stephen's past. Just six months after Rhonda's death, Stephen was arrested and charged with five counts of sexual abuse, this time for allegedly touching a 13-year-old girl. Stephen denied the accusations, but later admitted to sending the girl a sexually suggestive ball sex message along with a picture of himself without a shirt up. Acknowledging the inappropriate nature of his actions, Stephen pleaded guilty to one count of sexual harassment. During a preliminary hearing, the prosecution introduced photos Rhonda had taken of herself to document bruises on her back, which she said came from fights with Stephen. Rhonda's best friend also testified, saying she had overheard multiple arguments between the couple during phone calls with Rhonda. The court further heard testimony from Stephen's ex-wife, who claimed he had once tried to suffocate her and attempted to push her over the railing of their apartment building's fourth floor back in 2003. However, Stephen was never charged for that incident and denied the accusations. Rhonda's family remained convinced that Stephen had murdered her, suspecting that his motive was financial. They claimed that Stephen had taken out a life insurance policy on Rhonda and had recently increased the coverage. Rhonda's mother was certain that Stephen, who had lost a significant amount of money through day trading the previous year, saw the policy payout as a way to solve his financial troubles. Friends and family also testified that Rhonda adored her nine-month-old daughter, and it was unthinkable that she would take her own life by jumping off the Eagle Creek Trail. In May 2017, Rhonda's family was devastated to learn that the state had reached a plea agreement with Stephen. Despite believing that Stephen had intentionally killed the Rhonda, the prosecution knew their case was weak due to the lack of physical evidence proving that he had pushed her from the trail. Stephen pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of criminally negligent homicide. He was credited with time served while waiting trial, but he had to remain on parole for three years. Stephen's ankle monitor was removed, and he was released from custody. However, Rhonda's family felt betrayed. They believed Stephen should have faced harsher punishment for what he had done. During the sentencing hearing, Rhonda's sister gave a powerful impact statement. She expressed her anger, telling Stephen that he had destroyed their family and caused them immense pain and grief. Rhonda's mother also shared her confusion and frustration, saying she couldn't understand how Stephen could have taken her daughter's life and left their family shattered. Stephen, however, maintained that he did not push Rhonda off the cliff. He claimed that he only accepted the plea deal because he needed to secure custody of his daughter, fearing he would run out of time to do so if he fought the charges. Despite his statements, Rhonda's family and friends never believed his version of events. In 2018, Stephen gave a shocking interview where he made disturbing comments about what happened on the day of Rhonda's death. He revealed that when he reached Rhonda after her fall, she was still alive. When asked if he had ended her suffering, Stephen responded with a chilling hypothetical. If you see your war buddy in pain and shoot him to end his suffering, is that murder? She suggested that taking such an action might be considered justified, even though it's still technically homicide. Although Stephen never explicitly confessed to harming Rhonda, his words hinted at a more sinister involvement in her death than he had previously admitted. Later in 2017, Rhonda's mother applied for Social Security survivor benefits on behalf of Rhonda's daughter. She claimed the child had been living with her, and she promised to use the money solely for the baby's care. However, the state accused her of fraud, alleging that the child had actually been living with Stephen between 2010 and 2014. The state charged Rhonda's mother with theft of government funds, claiming she had unlawfully collected nearly $40,000 in benefits over five years. Her defense team argued that her actions were motivated by a desire to protect her granddaughter from Stephen, 
fearing he would exploit the $1 million life insurance policy taken out on Rhonda's life. They also emphasized that Rhonda's mother had struggled with depression, which had worsened after her daughter's tragic death. In 1979, Mike Rell married his first wife, Dee Hoffman, while they were both students at the University of Florida in Gainesville. From a young age, Mike seemed to have a bright future. He was a Boy Scout close to achieving the rank of Eagle Scout and served as an altar boy, which highlighted his strong values and character. During his college years at the University of Florida, Mike was involved in a fraternity, gaining friendships and support that helped him grow further. His talents in both sports and academics made him stand out, and he later graduated with a master's degree in business administration from the University of Miami, setting him up for a successful career. D. Mike's wife once described him as a supportive husband who never harmed her physically. However, after years together, their marriage began to fall apart. They had two daughters, Caroline and Kate, whom Mike adored. Yet, his demanding job often kept him away from home, leaving his daughters to grow up with his frequent absence. After 25 years of marriage, Dee asked Mike for a divorce and moved out of their home, wanting their daughters to have a familiar place to return to during college breaks. Mike, now 49, found himself single for the first time in many years and soon ventured into the world of internet dating, which was gaining popularity in the mid-2000s. He set up a profile on Match.com and soon met Susan, a 38-year-old Hispanic nurse. Mike and Susan's relationship blossomed quickly, filled with lovely dates and trips. Before long, Susan moved into Mike's house, taking over the space that had once been Dee's. Dee later shared in an interview with 48 Hours that everything she left behind had become Susan's, including her dog. When Caroline, Mike's daughter, met Susan, she had mixed feelings, especially noting how much Susan drank at their first meeting. Susan consumed several martinis yet managed to stay composed, which Caroline found unsettling. Despite Caroline's concerns, Mike and Susan got married in 2007. This marked a big change as Susan stopped working and Mike quit traveling for work. Instead, he bought a local business, Ocala Dental, which became the center of their new life together. To outsiders, Mike and Susan seemed like the perfect couple living in a luxury neighborhood in Hale Plantation, Florida, and often joking about their ideal life. But under the surface, their marriage faced serious challenges. In the summer of 2007, Mike drafted a prenuptial agreement, surprising their friends and family who saw them as a united pair. The reason for this sudden move stemmed from an incident at one of Mike's daughter's parties, where Susan's fiery temper flared, leading to a heated argument after she used offensive language in front of Mike's daughter. This incident made Mike rethink their future and consider protecting his assets. Though they seemed financially secure, Susan confessed to Mike that she had amassed $35,000 in credit card debt, which became a major worry for him. Another strain on their relationship was Susan's uneasy relationship with Mike's daughters. Caroline shared that she could only talk to her father when he was alone, as Susan's dislike for them made it difficult for Caroline to have meaningful conversations with him. Despite these issues, Mike and Susan's relationship seemed more stable on the outside. When Caroline announced her engagement in 2016, Susan eagerly took on a big role in the wedding plans, wanting to be involved in every detail. She even hosted a bridal shower which was traditionally organized by the bride's mother or sister. Susan deliberately left out Caroline's mother's friends from the guest list, but she made sure her own friends and family were invited. Although Susan's involvement seemed unusual at first, Caroline admitted the shower turned out to be a fun and memorable day. Susan put a lot of effort into making it special, and even joined Caroline on her wedding dress shopping trip, where she helped choose a $1,000 gown and generously paid for it with her credit card. In November 2017, Caroline had her wedding at the Grand Oka Castle in Long Island, attended by 160 guests. It was an elegant affair, reflecting the kind of luxury one would expect for a royal wedding. Just before walking Caroline down the aisle, Mike had a noticeable mark on his face. When Caroline asked him about it, he dismissed her concern, not wanting to bring any worry on her big day. Just three weeks after Caroline's wedding, Mike shared a shocking truth with her. The mark on his face, now a long white scar, was from an incident where his wife Susan had attacked him. He explained that Susan had physically assaulted him and was later arrested for domestic battery after an alcohol-fueled outburst. Susan, however, claimed that the argument began after she learned that Caroline's wedding had gone $150,000 over budget. 
Furious at this revelation, she admitted to throwing a phone at Mike and pushing him to end the argument. Susan was actually the one to call 911, and she later offered to stay at their beach condo to cool down. However, she delayed leaving, and police ended up arresting her for not vacating the premises. The court eventually required Susan to stay away from Mike, and she began alcohol counseling and anger management therapy. After some weeks, Mike chose not to press charges, and the case was dropped. Susan moved to a condo in Ponte Vedra, giving the couple a temporary break from their ongoing issues. But on February 3, 2018, this reprieve came to a terrifying end. At 4 a.m., Mike made a chilling 911 call from his Danesville, Florida home. He told the dispatcher that someone had broken into his house and that Susan was severely injured, bleeding heavily. When police arrived, they found Susan lying critically wounded on the bed in the master bedroom. Medics were called in urgently, and they rushed her to the nearest hospital, where doctors fought to save her life. She was in a critical condition, and her chances of survival looked bleak. Meanwhile, the house became a crime scene, and a detective arrived to examine the area thoroughly. In the master bedroom, he found a horrifying amount of blood on the bed and a bent, bloody knife. Yet, there was no sign of forced entry, no broken windows or tampered locks. The detective also reviewed security footage from Mike's home but found no evidence of anyone fleeing the scene. Amazingly, Susan survived the attack, though with severe injuries to her wrists, stomach, and neck. When she regained consciousness in the hospital, she made a shocking claim to the detectives, there was no intruder. Susan accused Mike himself of attacking her, alleging that he had fabricated the break-in story. Susan recounted that they'd argued at a restaurant that evening, after which they returned home separately. Once home, she went straight to bed, only to wake up to a sharp stabbing pain. When she opened her eyes, Mike was standing over her, holding a knife. Fear and confusion consumed her as she realized her life was in danger. She cried out, Michael, you're trying to kill me. To her horror, Mike allegedly replied, that's exactly what I want to do. According to Susan, he continued to stab her despite her cries for help. For an agonizing hour, she lay bleeding and in pain. Mike told her he would spare her if she stuck to his story of an intruder. Desperate to survive, Susan reluctantly agreed. Mike then changed his clothes, called 911, and pretended there had been a robbery. Following Susan's testimony, authorities arrested Mike on attempted murder charges. The news of Mike's arrest sent shockwaves through his family and friends. His ex-wife, Dee, who had been married to him for years, was stunned by the accusations. During their marriage, she had never seen any signs of violence or aggression in him. Dee struggled to believe that the man she once loved could be accused of such a brutal crime. Mike's daughters, Caroline and Kate, were equally shocked. They had always respected and admired their father, seeing him as kind and generous. The idea that he could harm their stepmother was unimaginable to them. As the case unfolded, additional charges were filed against Mike, including false imprisonment, obstruction, and tampering with evidence. These charges only added to the complexity of the case, making it more severe. Given Mike's wealth, the judge set a bond of $2.5 million for the extra charges, but he was denied bond for the attempted murder charge due to the crime's severity. Mike's arrest rattled the community, with many who knew him struggling to reconcile their view of him with the shocking charges he faced. Several months passed as the legal proceedings advanced following his February 2018 arrest. On June 29th, Mike was arrested and charged with attempting to solicit and conspire to commit a capital felony. Prosecutors alleged that Mike had tried to hire an inmate to murder his wife, Susan. The state attorney's office claimed Mike sought help from 33-year-old Rodri Germain McCollum, who also faced charges in the alleged murder for hire plot. During the 2019 trial, new details emerged, shedding light on the tumultuous relationship between Mike and Susan. In his testimony, Mike portrayed their marriage as strained and full of tension. He explained that few people visited their home, largely because Susan was uncomfortable with Mike's friends from his university advisory board. Another source of conflict, according to Mike, was his charitable giving. 